Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. If you heard of an Islamic state leader who beheaded thousands of people, who after being captured by US troops proceeded to blow himself up in a suicide bombing, killing many innocent women and children in the process, what would your opinion of that man be? You might label him vile, a disgrace, pure evil. But what if instead of being an Islamic state leader today. That man was an Israelite leader and judge around 3,000 years ago. What if instead of committing atrocities in the name of Allah, this man committed atrocities in the name of Yahweh, the God of the Bible and the Old Testament? But before I delve into them, I'd just like to say that if you enjoy my content and you appreciate the workload that goes into making each video, it would mean a lot to me if you subscribed to the channel. Also, if you'd like to be notified when I release a new video, ensure you have the notification bell turned on and you'll be among the first people to watch it. In the book of Judges chapters 14 to 16, we encounter the notorious Israelite leader and judge, Samson. A sexually immoral liar, a gambler, a thief, a vandal, an arsonist, an animal abuser, a serial killer and someone who at their death also killed thousands of other people, including many innocent women and children. Would Christians still label this man vile, a disgrace and pure evil? No. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. He is put on a pedestal, hailed by some as the first superhero, an early superhero and the original superhero. As a young child, I was handed my book of Bible stories and the story of Samson in particular captivated my interest. It quickly became my favourite. Fast forward 20 years to 2018 when Pure Flix released the film Samson. As a self-professed Christian at the time, it gave me goosebumps. I thought it was incredible, it was inspirational and it served to only reinforce the label that I'd long attached to Samson, that he was indeed the world's original superhero. But before we assess whether Samson befits such a title and label as a superhero, we should first ask the question, what is a superhero? Firstly, and perhaps obviously, it is someone who possesses superhuman power or ability. But most importantly, they need to have an internal desire to help make the world a better place by ridding it of perceived evil. If Christians are so freely labelling Samson as a superhero, then surely they wouldn't shy away from or be afraid of a side-by-side -side comparison to a modern-day superhero. For in theory, it should only reinforce and bolster this label that they've attached to him. But who should I pick? Well, I'm not sure about you, but if I was asked to select just one superhero from one film who epitomizes and embodies what it means to be a real superhero, I would look no further than Christopher Reeve, starring in the 1978 blockbuster Superman. I understand that many Christians will say, come on, really? Samson and Superman? They're not going to be identical. 
These two characters, these stories are separated by two and a half thousand years, meaning there's going to be major historical and cultural differences. I completely agree. They're not going to be identical. There will be historical and cultural differences. But Christians, including my former self, are labelling Samson as a superhero today. When the mental image, the mental picture of what a superhero is, has been crafted and created by modern society and modern media. And therefore now is the time when this comparison is most relevant. I've broken down this comparison into only three categories. Violence and justice, revenge and honesty, and ego and selfishness. Although the exact number of men, women and children killed by Samson is not specifically stated in the biblical narrative, by gradually accumulating the figures together, we arrive at a safe estimate of between eight to 10,000 people. He was a man who had an almost insatiable appetite for bloodshed, killing people even when there was absolutely no need to do so. A classic example of this was at his marriage feast. For those relatively unfamiliar of the story of Samson, he had three great loves, women, violence, but perhaps the love that surpassed even those was his love for riddles. Surrounded on his special occasion by 30 Philistine groomsmen, all probably highly intoxicated on beer and wine, he simply couldn't resist the urge to tell them a riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Normally with a riddle, such as what gets wet while drying. The person or group of people you're telling it to, when given enough time, stand at least a small chance of figuring out the answer. The problem with Samson's riddle is that he was alluding to a personal event in which he tore a lion in two with his bare hands, and then later when passing by the lion's carcass, found some honey in it which he ate. But he didn't tell his mother, he didn't tell his father, and he didn't tell his wife-to-be. And so not one person in the world was aware of these personal events of Samson's life. And so with all that in mind, Samson devised an unfair way of profiting off his own riddle. If during the seven days of the banquet you solve it and tell me the answer, I will have to give you 30 linen garments and 30 outfits of clothing. But if you are unable to tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 outfits of clothing. Can you imagine Clark Kent, before other people knew of his real identity as Superman, telling a bunch of co-workers in his office, guys, guys, gather around, right? I'm gonna tell you a riddle and if you don't get it, you all owe me 30 outfits of clothing, 30 nice new suits. Here it is. A journey begun on Krypton, but had to flee. Sent to the earth, lifted a truck aged just three. You know why Superman wouldn't do that? Because he is fair, he is just, and he doesn't seek to take advantage of other people. Astonishingly, in the story of Samson, these Philistine men found out the answer to his riddle. And therefore, Samson found himself in a situation he never expected to be in. He owed 30 linen garments and 30 outfits of clothing to these 30 men. Now, if that was you or me, we would probably gather our community together and say, do we have these items of clothing? Can we get them? If we don't have them, can we start producing them from scratch? Let's just get them as soon as possible and give them to the 30 men. But not Samson. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 of their men and took their clothing and gave the outfits to those who had answered the riddle. This barbaric slaughter of 30 men was completely unprovoked and completely unnecessary. But perhaps the most astonishing aspect of this story when you read it in the Bible is who provided Samson with the power to kill these individuals. Then Jehovah's spirit empowered him 
and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 of their men. Yes, the loving, kind, caring, merciful, just God of the Bible ensured that no matter how much blood was spilt, no matter how many families were devastated, how many wives were widowed and children became fatherless, Samson would at least be able to pay off his gambling debt. Superman, on the other hand, even when held at gunpoint by a thief, never contemplates the use of violence. He told the man, you can't solve society's problems with a gun. Later he said, I've never been able to understand violence in any form. It's abundantly clear that Superman's purpose on Earth is not to physically fight. But as he says, his purpose is to fight for truth and justice and the American way. When he catches criminals escaping from the police on a boat, he delivers the criminals chained to the boat outside of a police station. Even after catching his arch nemesis Lex Luthor, he acknowledges the fact that he is not the ultimate authority and once again hands them in. Superman asks Luthor, is this how a warped brain like yours gets its kicks? By planning the death of innocent people? Luther responds, no, by causing the death of innocent people. After losing his own bet and storming off like a small child, sometime later Samson returned to visit his wife, but was about to receive news that would shock him and enrage him. His wife had been married off to one of his Philistine groomsmen. This made Samson so irate that he decided to declare outright war. Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Then he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail and put one torch between each pair of tails. Then he set fire to the torches and sent the foxes out into the fields of standing grain of the Philistines. He set on fire everything from sheaf to standing grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. By tying the tails of two foxes together and inserting a flaming torch between them, Samson ensured that they would do maximum damage to the Philistines' crops and livelihood. They would run in a crooked line, setting fire to as many crops as possible, in as many locations as possible. Of course, for the foxes, it would be terrifying and sheer torture. They would either be burned alive or die a slow, painful death afterwards. Samson had already taken the lives of 30 men. Now, in an act of disproportionate revenge, he was taking away the livelihood and food supply of countless families. Does Superman behave the same? When he feels he is badly mistreated, does he exact the same callous retribution? No. What would Samson have done? A man who killed 1,000 Philistine soldiers with only the jawbone of a donkey. Before Brad the bully could even blink, Samson would have picked up an American football helmet and pummeled Brad's head into the floor. One by one, as Brad's mates came running out the locker room, Samson would gradually annihilate them and dismember them. Till he stood on a bloody mass of human flesh. Well, despite the Bible saying that God cannot lie, and that therefore lying lips are detestable to Jehovah, he repeatedly deceives and misleads the woman he apparently loves. When Delilah asks him where his strength is derived from, what is the source of his strength? Unfortunately for Samson, the conclusion of his biblical story is not quite as glamorous. After evading being captured by the Philistines for a long time, Samson had now been seized, his hair had been shaved, and therefore his power had been sapped. Unable to overpower mortal men, they had removed his eyes and taken him back to Gaza, where he was put to work as a chained slave, grinding grain in their prison. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse for Samson, the Philistines decide to throw a large celebration. Thousands of men, women and children are all in attendance. 
To provide all these people with entertainment and amusement, Samson is brought out of the prison and chained between pillars for all to witness and enjoy. What follows this is one of the most frequently highlighted, yet overly romanticised parts of the story. Then Samson braced himself against the two middle pillars that supported the house, and he leaned on them with his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson called out, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and the house fell on the lords and all the people in it. So he killed more at his death than he had killed during his life. A believer might look at this and say, wow, absolutely incredible. A heroic, altruistic act of self-sacrifice. He died in the process, he literally had nothing to gain, but still in his final moments, he managed to bring glory to God and benefit his chosen people. But was it really this altruistic self-sacrificing act? Was he really thinking about God and the Israelites? Remember, this wasn't a free, young, fit, healthy man. This was a broken, blinded, defeated, disgraced, dead man walking. It was either suicide or, at a latter point, execution. Thankfully, we don't have to be in any doubt as to Samson's real motive behind this act, for the Bible provides it for us. Strengthen me, please, just this once, O God, and let me take revenge on the Philistines for one of my two eyes. Not let me take revenge for you or for your people, but for one of my two eyes. Samson had been mocked, Samson had been tortured. His ego hadn't just been bruised, but had been completely shattered. And so in this final act of killing thousands of men, women and children, he ensured that despite being laughed at, he had the last laugh. And therefore, the superhero story of Samson is exactly what we would expect it to be. A Bronze aged narcissistic, Jewish male power fantasy on steroids. A Christian at this point might say, well, you've got a point there. He was a Jew. He, he, he was a Nazarite. He was an Israelite. And so it was at a different time and it was in very different circumstances. If that's the case, why is Samson recorded as an example worthy of imitation in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith? Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Samson will be rewarded with a resurrection on paradise earth, that he will walk amongst them in the new system. Does this mean then that evil is just subjective to a certain time period, to a certain place and to a certain culture? It's not supposed to be in the eyes of Christians. They will almost unanimously agree that God and Jesus Christ, who in themselves don't change, set an objective standard for good and evil. But when they reflect and meditate on the personality of Jesus, who is supposed to be the Bible's superhero, they might come to acknowledge the fact that Samson actually embodies everything a biblical superhero shouldn't be. He was not honest. He lied. He stole. He was sexually immoral. He did not possess any of the fruitages of the spirit in Galatians 5. He was not mild. He did not have self-control or patience. And he did not turn the other cheek when attacked or provoked. He sought revenge on his enemies. And therefore, the problem for Christians is when they allow the New Testament, their favourite testament, to define what evil is. They will see that that definition befits not only Satan, but also Samson. I reflect on my own former self-professed Christian mind and ask myself, why did I view Samson as a superhero? And I suppose the answer boils down to two things. Ignorance and indoctrination. 
indoctrinated at a young age through books like this, into viewing life simply as black and white, as good and bad, and that good must always conquer bad. The Philistines are bad people who live in Canaan. Samson also kills hundreds of bad Philistines. When Samson bends himself against the pillars, the building falls down and kills all these bad people. Christopher Hitchens famously stated, religion poisons everything. But perhaps most significantly, it poisons our perception of good and evil. Were all of the Philistine men, women and children slain by Samson really that bad? Or had they just been raised from birth to believe in different gods? They were human. They had families they loved. They defended themselves. On occasion they attacked. They offered sacrifices to their gods. Everything they did, the Israelites did too. But by labelling those outside of our nation, outside of our tribe as evil, as contaminating and bad, it ties into our tribal ancestry, which was key to our survival. It unites the inside group and makes it stronger and fortified. And it provides an us versus them barrier with the outside world. If we are told from infancy that we belong to a special chosen nation or people selected by the gods, then any violence against those pagan pigs on the outside can be rationally justified and has been throughout the course of history. As Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Many Christians will say, well, don't be so silly. We are completely against the use of violence in any form. We are peaceable. And yet at the same time, they condone and advocate the violent, vengeful behaviour of their God. In the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, that means each member proactively supporting God's decision, coming very soon apparently, to commit the mass genocide of 8 billion people. But it's okay because they're outsiders. They are evil and bad. You may be thinking, well, that's Jehovah's Witnesses. They're a cult. They're not Christians. I don't believe in that and I don't support that. But you may be advocating something far worse. The eternal punishment and pain of billions of souls in the fiery, unrelinquishable depths of hell. All of these teachings, all of these beliefs to a free-thinking mind that's escaped religious programming are completely unpalatable and outdated. And it pains me to say that the answer to the question, is Samson a superhero, is yes. But only to religious believers, to a religious niche, who honestly believe that committing mass slaughter of apostates, of non-believers, and of outsiders who don't bow down to their God, is justifiable and acceptable behaviour, as long as it's done in the name of their God, or through the power of their God. To most people, however, including former believers like myself, who have taken our rose-tinted glasses off, when we reread the biblical account, rather than looking at children's books or Christian propaganda films, we see the character of Samson for who he really was. A narcissistic psychopath who, if he was alive today, would be either executed or serving life in prison. Because he unnecessarily killed people to pay off his gambling debt and took the lives of many innocent women and children who'd never caused anyone any harm, he is as close as possible to what most people would consider and label evil. Jesus is the model educator. He's the protector of his students. He will teach them and he will protect them. He will tell them what they need to know, what they need to do, and what they need to beware of and run from and avoid. What about you? What about you? Do you love Christ? Do you embrace Him as your Lord and Savior? Are you captive to a religion 
that you're loyal to that is led by false teachers telling you lies and making you a prisoner of their deception. I warn you, as Jesus warned, there's only one hope of salvation, and that's in Him. Reject Him, and you are lost forever. And the punishment is forever outside of His presence. The man made his choice, wrong choice, tragic choice. The kind of a microcosm of Judas who encountered Jesus, saw His power, heard His words, heard His warning, and chose hell. Tragic story. Sets the tone for the rest of the gospel and the rejection to come. These um, children of Satan see Jesus then as an enemy. They see him as a disturber. They see him as a blasphemer, a lawbreaker. They can't contain themselves in dealing with him. They're so full of fury at him. Why does he do this? Why does he exacerbate this conflict? Why does he elevate this? Why does he raise it to this level? Why does he say things like, you're of your father the devil, you're liars and murderers, and you desire what the devil desires? Why does he say that? Well, the answer is because he loves them. Because this is a mercy. It is a mercy to shatter false securities. It is a mercy to devastate false religion. It is a mercy to strip people locked in some form of religious deception, strip them naked of that deception. These are people with the emperor's clothes. They need to be exposed for what they are. Their false religion needs to be dealt with in a very strong, stern confrontation. The blasphemy comes in verse 48. The Jews answered, now remember, he has just said, you're of your father the devil. That's the high point. That's the most outrageous thing that in their minds, anybody could ever say of them because they thought God was their God, as Jesus says they claim a little later in the dialogue. So he says, you're of your father the devil. Their reaction, rather than taking the exposure and saying, whoa, whoa, help us. What are we missing? Lead us to the truth. They harden their hearts. They become harder and harder and more bitter and more bitter. And so they respond in verse 48, here's the first blasphemy. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Apparently they've been saying this a lot. This is their mantra. This is, this is what they've said. As I noted a moment ago in chapter 10 uh, in verse 20, many of them said he has a demon and is insane. This has been the standard statement about Jesus. This is what the leaders had cultivated about Him. See it in Matthew 11, 18. In Mark 3, uh, 22, it says He is possessed by Satan. A Satan possessed, not just demon possessed, but Satan possessed. Matthew 12, He does what He does by the power of Beelzebub, which is another name for Satan. They, they were spreading the word. Here they justify it. Do we not rightly say that you are an insane, demon-possessed Samaritan? So the stakes are very high. This is not a time to invite them uh, to, to some, in some genteel way to embrace the blessings of salvation. This is a time to warn them because they are in severe danger having made the conclusions they have made. And by the way, one of their conclusions was that Jesus Himself was from the devil. And He tells them, the truth is, you are the devil's children. 